Good morning everyone and welcome to the Restore Livestream. It's great to have you with us today and it's great that we can continue uh, on with our series uh, that we've called Messy Church. We called it Messy Church because, uh, not because it's a preschool uh, thing, there's a whole uh, initiative in the UK called Messy Church, which is kind of church for preschools, um, but actually it's church dealing with the messy issues in life. And uh, life is messy, people are people, we all carry our baggage, and sometimes church life can be messy as well. And one of the things I said uh, in the introduction to it is, sometimes I think we have unrealistic expectations. We're like, I'm gonna join a church and it, uh, this church is perfect, and then uh, life is gonna be happy. Uh, but the reality is uh, uh, I'm imperfect, um, you're imperfect. If I join what was a perfect church, I would make it imperfect. Um, but the reality is every church is imperfect. We're a group of ordinary people living in a broken society with our history, doing the best we can to follow Jesus. But sometimes life will be tough and sometimes that will overflow into church life being tough. And uh, we're using, uh, for this series, we're losing, using the book of 1 Corinthians because uh, the church in Corinth, which was a major port at the time of uh, Paul, uh, the church in Corinth had a notorious, well, the city of Corinth had a notorious reputation in terms of the way that they lived. Um, but that infected the church in Corinth as well. And uh, Paul had heard some of the stories, had had some contact with them. So he writes the letter to address some of the major issues. But when I was reading it earlier in the year, I realized that a lot of the issues that Paul addresses in the church in Corinth are actually issues that we need to think about today and think about how do we do them well, because people are people. And so 2000 year ago, people grappled with the same things as they do now. Hey, what a shocker. Um, people fall out with people. What do you do when you uh, uh, fall out with someone? How do you work reconciliation into that? Uh, uh, how do we protect ourselves against factions and uh, 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 having cliques within church life that we associate with the people that we like or the people that are like us? Those kind of things. And today we're dealing with, with a, two sides, really, of, of, of one issue. Um, of two parts of one issue, um, but it's a great one, um, and I will try and do it well and graciously. Um, but today we're going to talk about the role of church discipline, uh, and also we're going to talk about uh, sexual immorality. And so, hey, they're big uh, topics for a Sunday morning, aren't we? So I hope you're going to enjoy this one. But this was one of the major issues going on in, in Corinth, and actually uh, sexuality and boundaries are big issues in society today. Does anything really go? Is everything good for us? If it feels good, do it. Is that okay? Um, what does Jesus feel about that? What does the Bible tell us about that? And how, in a culture that has thrown off all boundaries, how do we deal with that well? And what happens when some of those things go wrong within the context of a local church family? How do we handle them? How do we respond to them? These are really good, uh, big issues. And the reality is, I think we have to face, the church hasn't dealt with these issues well. I, I think um, I might say a bit more about this a little bit later, but often it feels like the church has got its knickers in the twist about anything around sexuality, and we've ignored a whole load of other stuff. And that isn't right, because sexuality is a part of life, but it's not all of life. And uh, when Paul writes about uh, things that are wrong in life, he talks about jealousy, rage, anger, greed, stealing, lying, as well as sexual immorality. But it seems like the church always, always has got a highlight on sexual immorality and ignores the other stuff. That's not right. Sexual, it, 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 sexual, sexuality, like I say, is part of life but it's only one issue in many. And actually, if, if we are gonna exercise discipline over that, we need to be prepared to exercise discipline over other issues that are out of life, that, that are out of line as well. Uh, uh, secondly, I, I think from the headlines and things, often the church hasn't faced some of the issues within itself around sexuality, and particularly in terms of church leadership. And uh, that's not a good culture either. We want an open, transparent culture and we want a culture that takes safety seriously and valuing individuals. And we don't want um, any secrecy or hiddenness. You know, some churches um, uh, have issued uh, uh, non or made non-disclosure agreements uh, with members of staff that they've let go and all of those things. And we've, uh, we as a church, we've always resisted anything like that. Um, because we want to build a culture that you can ask anything. And uh, we're signed up to, as part of a a agencies like 318, which is a national safeguarding agency. 
um, because we want to have good policies in place because good policies and procedures protect everyone and actually one of our commitments on that is if anybody makes an allegation uh, about anybody's behaviour um, and certainly anybody's in leadership we have a process that we will go through to make sure that is independently and properly and fully um, investigated and followed through because it's important we get these things right for everybody's benefit. You know, as a leader, it's important that I'm open to accountability and willing to be accountable because I'm a person as well as a leader and I have my own issues and it's important that I'm willing to uh, learn and face some of those things. And we need to have a culture that is able to do that. And so when we say messy church, I think we're able to say, um, let's talk on some of these issues because the culture we want to bring in Restore is a culture that is transparent, open, and willing to deal with the tough issues in life because that's where the rubber hits ro the road. And that's actually for the, the potential for, for the greatest freedom, power, and impact going forward. So we are gonna talk a bit about uh, immorality because that's what the passion, pas passage is about. But in thinking, let's widen it out a little bit. And we're gonna talk about the role of church discipline. And some of this, I'll give you my take on, um, but really what we're wanting to do is open up a conversation and discussion. So I've said all the way through, but I think the most important uh, part of this uh, uh, series will be the conversations we have following on from the teaching. So in lots of ways, we'll open up an issue, but then we need to take it away and talk about it in our small group or talk about it in our family, wrestle with some of the things. I'm not gonna tell you necessarily what to believe, but I'm gonna raise some of the issues. I might tell you what I think, but what you, you then need to work out, what do you think in relation to what you've heard and what you read in the Bible and what you understand? And uh, we've never been the kind of church that tells you what you have to believe. We're the kind of church that says, hey, let's follow Jesus. But actually, what's Jesus saying to you? What's your interpretation of what Jesus is speaking to you? And we need to encourage, because that's maturity, isn't it? Um, you know, your kids grow up and we want uh, everyone to grow up in our relationship with Jesus. We don't want to just be treating everyone like a, like a toddler and they need to be told at every turn. We want to grow a maturity and wisdom in it. Anyway, that's a long intro, isn't it? Um, I'm going to carry on. Uh, I'm going to read a bit from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is an issue where Paul talks about church discipline and it's an issue about sexual immorality. So I'm going to read this. I'll probably stop at various points along the way just to point out things. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit around it. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 through to 13. It is actually reported that there is, sexually, that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. So what Paul is saying is there's not just issues of sexual brokenness evident in the life of the church, and there's probably issues of sexual brokenness in one form or another going on in every church community. Um, he's saying though, this is worse than is even happening in the world and nobody seems to be reacting to it. So he's not just saying we need to dive in on every struggle that's happening in every marriage or, or every aspect of uh, somebody's sexuality. What he is saying, though, is there's something here that's massively out of order. And even society, even the wider culture would be struggling with this. Why aren't you addressing it? So of a kind that even pagans, people who aren't calling themselves followers of Jesus, don't tolerate a man is sleeping with his father's wife. So we're talking about incest. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And then he goes on, and you are proud. In other words, you're not ashamed by it. You're not shocked by it. You're not thinking, this can't be right. How come this is happening in, openly in this church? Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out your fellowship put out of your fellowship the man who's been doing this shouldn't you have taken some action this isn't okay for my part even though I'm not physically present I am with you in spirit in other words he fathered the church so he's been praying for it he's been caring for it that's why he's writing to it as one who is present with you in this way I've already passed judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the one who's been doing this in other words I've already said 
this isn't okay. I've already determined with my understanding of scripture, this shouldn't be allowable in what we call the bride of Christ. So when you're assembled and I'm with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is, pre is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. He didn't hear somebody say that in the last couple of weeks in church. I'm handing you over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh. What Paul is really saying is, is he says, say to them, you're not welcome in church. Because of your behaviour, you're not actually aligning yourselves as a follower of Jesus. So don't, don't kid yourself. <laughs> you're not welcome until you're willing to deal with that issue. And if you're no longer part of church, the reality is you're part of the kingdom of darkness. And hopefully the fruit of a life that becomes bankrupt because of poor choices, because that's what happens, we reap what we sow. Hopefully the fruit of that, a bit like the prodigal son, who left his father's home because he wanted to pursue his own way, but then when he reaped what he'd sown, decided to come back, hopefully the destruction in his life as a result of bad choices will bring him to a point that he wants to come back. So we're letting him go, or we're putting him out, or we're saying you need to go, not because we want to get rid of him forever, but because we hope that by not accepting that behaviour because it's not doing him or us any good, they will come to a point of, ah, oh, I need to sort this out, and then they'll be won back. Any discipline always has its root, should have as its root, the desire to win someone. It's not to judge someone, shame somebody, or uh, humiliate someone. It's to help them grapple with the real issue that's undermining their ability to grow in Jesus and ultimately so they might be won back into the family. Paul goes on, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. In other words, we're handing you over so that as you reap what you sow, ultimately that will bring you to a point of, like the prodigal son, I'm going to go home, I'm going to sort it out. goes on, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new un unleavened batch as you really are. In the Old Testament, um, leaven, which you put in bread to make it rise, uh, leaven uh, was uh, 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 often uh, pictured as being like sin, and sin spreads in a loaf, <laughs> or leaven spreads in a loaf, and sin can spread in a body and impact the whole body. And uh, when, they were, when Israel was in a time of purification, they would get rid of all the leaven, they'd bake without any leaven. And it would be a practical sign of saying, God, will you remove everything from us that isn't good, that can infect the body? So that's what he's talking about when he talks about leaven and yeast and stuff. Um, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. In other words, we want the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the power of the cross, to wash us and transform our lives so we become holy and pure, not engaged in incest or tolerating that in our midst, because it isn't the way of Jesus. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. In other words, we can't be frumpy and offloading about everyone who's, who's immoral in the world. Otherwise, we'll be just a clique of judgmental people that have nothing to do with the society around us. When we're meant to be salt and light, we're meant to be the ones in the midst of the mess coming to bring change, which is how Jesus lived. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother and a sister, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, or an idolater, or a slanderer, or a drunkard, or a swindler. Do not each with such people. So Paul's saying, I, I'm taking issue about this situation because it's the one there in front of you, but actually there's other things that are just as bad and that we should not be tolerating in our midst because they're not good at representations of what Jesus is like. Then he goes, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? They don't know about Jesus. They don't know God's grace. Let's not be a, a, a critical, judgmental people. You know, Jesus got uh, uh, lambasted 
for hanging around with broken people and immoral people, but he was there because he knew at the root of their brokenness was the fact that they were living a life separate from God and he was there to reach out, to reconnect them to God. And then as they got reconnected with God, the desire was their life would change. Says the woman caught in adultery, he doesn't condemn her. When, when the religious people of the day were wanting to throw stones at them. I think we've done this so badly as a church. We're known for being people who throw stones at the gay community or, or at the trans community or, or people having abortions. We throw stones at them and we, we judge them. Jesus, in the story of the woman <laughs> caught in adultery, John chapter 8, took a totally different stance. He refused to condemn. He stood alongside in grace. But also, he said at the end, go and sin no more. In other words, this revelation of the love of God has the power in the Holy Spirit to bring transformation to you that you will no longer need to live that way. Jesus wasn't saying it's okay what the woman had done, but he was saying is God's gracious and he wants to reconnect with you so that transformation can happen in your life. Um, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? In other words, shouldn't we call one another to account? Not meaning that every time we get together, we point the finger at one another, but as a body, as a family, where we see something going on that isn't good, that's hurting other people, that's hurting the people inside, we have love enough to be able to say to someone, actually, is that okay? Have you noticed that? Have you realised that? that? And he says, God will judge those outside, but expel the wicked person from among you if you need to, if that's what it takes. So, I will talk a little bit about sexuality. Like I say, I think we've done a really bad job on it as a church, partly because we have put the spotlight on it and we haven't put the spotlight on other things. And I think in this day and age, we need to be willing to put the spotlight on everything that is ungodly. And uh, particularly the, the uh, uh, maybe the hidden heart things of jealousy, anger, rage, greed, lying, um, and drunkenness. Um, but the Bible does take issue with um, sexuality being misused or abused. Um, and uh, that's because when God creates the first man and the first woman, he creates them uh, to be complementary. So he says, in the image of God, he made mankind male and female, he made them. And there's something about the unity of a man and a woman that together has the opportunity to display the glory of God. And so God's first best for mankind was that a man and a woman would be joined together and in that being joined together, they would display something of the uniqueness and the wonder of God to the world around them. And so marriage is called to display the goodness of God to the world around. And so uh, some of the ingredients, therefore, of a marriage uh, need to be headed towards displaying the goodness of Jesus. So, so in the Bible, Jesus is called the bride and the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is the bride of Christ. And... God is faithful. So when a man and a woman come together, they're meant to come together forever because it's a statement of the faithfulness of God and the commitment of God. Yes, there are some cases that uh, we'll look at, we actually cover in another week, um, whereby uh, uh, maybe it is okay for a marriage to uh, uh, break or end. Um, but God's original intent was a marriage would stay together and it would be a covenantal agreement made in the sight of God because it's a representation of God's perfect love for mankind. And just as on a wedding day, you know, I can, and we've been married 30 years this uh, year, um, but on our wedding day, I spent a long time in a new suit and everything, making myself look as good as I possibly could. Um, and uh, Chris did the same, and probably even more so does the bride, and probably spends a lot more on, on dresses and all of those kind of things, because you want to look your absolute best. And if you translate that into spiritual language, it's because I wanted to be clean and pure. So that when I made a commitment to Chris, I was bringing the best of who I could be. And uh, boundaries around sexuality in terms of uh, not giving yourself to another until your wedding day is because you value your sexuality 
and you value it enough to preserve it, to then invest in one person. And when we give it away all over the place, we actually devalue sexuality and the value of it and the place of it. And we end up devaluing one another, as well as, because in the Bible it's a covenant, it, it, it's an agreement, it's a deep expression of becoming one flesh. If we sleep with people all over the place, it's like we bond to them and we leave a little bit with them. And then we wonder why we've lost who we really are and we've lost that sense of identity. It's because we've too freely given it about all over the place. And so God gives boundaries around sexuality, but he gives them for our own good. And so that in our marriages, then we will give a representation of what his heart is to the world around so that other people will learn the wisdom of living with God. And the issue in Corinth is those boundaries had been blown all over the place. And uh, it had created an issue that needed to be dealt with. And I talked earlier about the leavened bread and the unleavened bread. The reality is sin spreads. You know, we live not just in a physical world, but we live in a spiritual world. And uh, it's interesting in the Ten Commandments, actually, the first uh, uh, commandment is, is you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, you will centre your life, you'll worship me, the, the God of eternity, you'll worship me as your God. But the language that's used is actually exactly the same as the language for committing adultery. <laughs> it, it, it literally says, you'll have no other gods to my face. And the words used are, are the words you would use for a man in a marriage who then commits adultery with someone else. And you see, it's putting that language because spiritually stepping away from God will release something physically that damages me. And as I reconnect to God, that, needs, that will have an outworking or needs to have an outworking in my physical life and how I live. And because we're spiritual beings, and so a church isn't just a physical collection of people, it's a spiritual coming together of a people coming and opening up their spirits to God and welcoming God's spirit at work. That also means if a demonic spirit or an unclean spirit is loosed in the life of a church, it will spread. And so one of the reasons we deal with this is because my sin does impact you and your sin does impact me. Paul says we're a body, doesn't he? And he says, he says we need each other. And he talks about a hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. Um, but he also talks about that if one part of the body hurts, the rest of it hurts. And what Paul's talking about here is, is sin in one area will spread and impact the others if we don't deal with it. Which is why we always, first and foremost, we need to have hearts that are continually saying, God, what sin do I need to repent of? God, what sin are you needing to show me? God, help me get rid of it because it will... It will, otherwise it will negatively impact me, but it will negatively impact the relationships I'm a part of, my family, my church, my home group. And uh, I'm not saying that to frighten you, I'm just saying that because it's the truth that Paul says in the word of God. That's why I think in a regular practice in church life should be communion. Because when we have communion, we don't just remember the cross, but we take those moments to say, God, what do I need to say sorry for now? God, what do I need to own? God, what do I need to repent of? And a holy body, a holy church, will be a church where every part is willing to work on its stuff and invite the Holy Spirit to reveal where we're not living like Jesus and then work together to better live like Jesus. And that's what Paul says here. So he says, the thing is, you're bringing shame on the church but you're damaging one another. And you see, true love doesn't tolerate some things. Sometimes I think we think, oh, I just need to love everyone. And if I love everyone, then, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter. Some things do matter. Sometimes true love draws a boundary. And this is what we're talking about, aren't we? You know, every family needs boundaries. Every family needs, needs a mom and a dad. It needs parents to teach the kids. And if the church is a family, we need more mature folk that, let's call them leaders, but other people that we respect that set some boundaries for the well-being of the family, not because they want to dominate or dictate or control, hopefully, but because they understand that to grow people requires boundaries and instructions. And then discipleship becomes discipleship because we put ourselves under those boundaries. 
And so we willingly submit to that discipline. That's why if you get upset in one church and you run away to another, the question you need to ask, be asking is, am I running away from facing some issues? And would I grow better if I stayed and work through those issues? Because I think more often than not, we would. And the danger of a, a consumer society is we become consumeristic in our faith. And so I go to church to be entertained. I go to church to have a word that I enjoy. I go to church for a set of relationships I like. Actually, we should go to church to be a community that works through our issues to grow in God. And actually, sometimes I need to be uncomfortable in church because it's raising issues I need to face and I do need to feel uncomfortable about. And then when I feel uncomfortable about them, I shouldn't just pack up shop and go down the road because Tesco's is cheaper than Aldi this week. I, I, I should stay where I am and have the courage to face those issues. And growth comes by uh, growing up together. That's why in a marriage, I think um, the vast majority of people that I've known that have walked out on a marriage for a not great reason have ended up walking out on subsequent relationships and marriages. And when you make a commitment before God, you make that commitment to journey through whatever, in sickness, in health, richer and poorer. And sometimes that is hard. But when I stood in the presence of God and my family with Chris, that's the commitment I made. And, and I, I've held to that and will hold to that because it's important. And sometimes that journey's been hard. Sometimes that journey's cost a lot. But you know what? I've grown enormously out of it. And church is the same thing. It's journeying together that we might grow into everything that Jesus has for us. The Bible says some really good stuff about uh, discipline. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. See, we know that for a family, but that has to be true, therefore, in the church family and in our relationship with God. Hebrews chapter 12, God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he likens the uh, walk with Jesus to a run uh, and uh, an athlete training for games. I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And a Paul-style version of Christianity is a style of Christianity that's continually saying, God, search me. God, what do I need to sort out in my life, in my body? And Paul knew he needed to sort it out in his own life before he could sort it out in other people's lives. That's why, that's why Jesus talked about, didn't he? Don't, don't point out uh, the thing going on in your brother's life when you've got a, a plank in your eye. It, 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 you know, you need to deal with yourself first, but we need a culture together that we're willing to deal with our stuff and together our stuff. And this is what Paul's talking about. And good leadership is like good parenting within the body that helps us grow up in it. Now, we have an extreme case uh, here with Paul. Hopefully, most cases don't get to that. You know, I had a bit too much to drink last week, or, or maybe I, th I can remember once being in a meeting with a group of leaders, and uh, we had an opportunity to share some of our stuff. And the first person was someone who worked uh, with me a lot, one of my kind of heroes, mentors. And she opened the meeting and she said, Sometimes I think I drink too much. And the whole meeting went quiet. Um, but she talked about that she'd got in the habit of going home late at night and to unwind, she'd have a drink. And, uh, and that's easy to do, isn't it? But she'd realised she was doing it more and more. And was it okay? And I really admired her for bringing it out into the open. Now, we didn't cast her out of the church, get her to stand down from leadership or anything like that. 
but it did mean she could be accountable and we could work together for it. Most issues can be sorted out just like that. It only becomes an issue if the person isn't willing to own it. And then love draws a boundary. And that's what's happening here. Love is drawing a boundary. And Paul, he talks through some of this in relation to this uh, issue of incest, which <laughs> is a big issue. Um, number one, he says, you should be mourning over the sin. And if we've lost our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit pointing out what is right or wrong, we've really lost our way. Uh, David writes in Psalms, search me and know my heart and see if there is any wicked way within me. So that is pretty much my daily prayer. Because at the end of the day, it's about me and God and me being in the best place I possibly can with God. Otherwise, good fruit's not going to flow from my life. And that means I need to be continually saying, God, search me. God, where am I at fault in this? God, this thing I've got angry about, God, what do I need to learn from it, own from it? Then, when the people aren't prepared to deal with it, he says, separate from them. And as I said earlier, not separate from them because you don't love them, you don't care for them. Separate from them because if they're not willing to own their stuff, don't let them do it. I remember years ago, um, talking to someone, I've, I've, I've only ever once put somebody out of, drawn a line like that, that's put somebody outside the regular meetings of a church. Um, and the reason I did it is because we had a family in the church, a long time ago this is, you wouldn't know the family, long, long time ago. Um, we had a family of four, and uh, the wife had ended up um, starting an affair uh, with another Christian, uh, another person who was part of the church, but not her husband. And um, it had come into light, come into the open. We had a number of meetings with them. Um, and the wife wouldn't give in on the new relationship or even admit it was wrong. And I remember um, sitting with her and, uh, and someone else, a pastoral worker, a woman, um, we, we were sitting having a conversation uh, with her and the fellow she was at, at and um, she at one point looked at me in the eye and said, the thing is Ian, God knew this was going to happen and because God has predestined everything, he's predestined this and he's going to bring something good out of it. Down through the years I've met people that have had really wonky theology at different points. In the Bible, it does talk about predestination. It doesn't mean every choice of my life is dictated by God. It means there's a position in Christ that I can enter into because Christ has made it available to me. But it's my choice whether I enter into that position and it's my choice whether I express the life of Jesus in my everyday life. And she genuinely, genuinely was holding to the ground of God's predestined this my choice is irrelevant and I'm not willing to face up to this issue. And we just thought, we can't have this playing out in our midst. And uh, we didn't just chuck her out. We didn't stand up on a Sunday and say, this person, we've handed over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. But we did say, I don't think in this season, and particularly remember her husband and kids were part of our church family as well. For this season, we will provide someone to meet with you on a Sunday morning and to look at the Bible with you. But we don't think it would be good for you to be part of the church community. She continued down that road and ended up bankrupt and an alcoholic and in a real mess. Because you reap what you sow. I don't know what the end of the story is. I hope, pray, trust that when she took the consequences of her actions, ultimately she came to a place of repentance reconnected with Jesus and found his grace because he'll always take you back. But you know what we needed to draw a line? And we didn't draw a line to shame or dishonour. Uh, you know, we didn't tell the church that we'd drawn the line either. But a line needed to be drawn. And sometimes in our own lives, we need to draw a line and say, actually, this isn't okay. I'm going to get help with this. Actually, this isn't okay. I need to bring it op into the open. And we need a church community that's strong enough to say, that's okay, I'll sit with you in the mess, but we will lead you 
to a better place because Jesus has more for you. I just want to say this morning, um, discipline in church life is not a popular topic, particularly these days, but that's because discipline in life, is in culture, is not a popular topic. But we live in a very broken, pained, awful society. And I would suggest it's because we've lost our way, because nobody set boundaries for us that we're willing to listen to. A good, healthy community will set those boundaries and help one another grow through them. I'm gonna pray, then I'm gonna hand over. Yeah, Lord, well, I think this is a really big issue, Lord, because I think if we're honest, Lord, we're so used to living in a culture that says anything goes, that often we translate that into our faith. And Lord, I just wanna say, I'm sorry, Lord, for where I haven't, come under your word. I'm sorry, Lord, for where I've been discipled by society rather than by you. I'm sorry, Lord, where I haven't valued your discipline because it's been good for my soul. And Lord, I repent of that right now. And Lord, I pray in this season, you will help me to face the ugliest part of Ian and bring it out into the light and bring it out with trusted folk around me that I might become a better representation of you. And I pray for anyone, everyone listening to this today. Father, if there's issues we're not facing up to, if there's issues we've run away from, Lord, will you forgive us? But I pray that you'll give us a connection point back into your family and into your love and into the real freedom that you have for us, which is living under your boundaries in relationship with you. Pray your grace and your love over each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just thinking while I was praying, uh, maybe you need to reach out to us, make contact so that you could sit down with someone and be honest and transparent and open. Uh, we'd love for you to be able to do that if you were to email elders at restorecc.org.uk uh, then the elders would connect with you and help you. If you want to reach out to me, ian.king at restorecc.org.uk. If you just want to send admin at restorecc.org.uk, we could connect you to a loving community that will help you grow in Jesus because that's our heart. God bless you.